so we're going to go ahead and get started. I want to introduce myself to you. My name is Warren Maloney. I'm a public information officer with the Northwest Incident Management Team of Music. Thank you for having us here tonight. Uh, I'm going to just share a couple of quick asks from you, and then we'll move right into getting you information. Uh, first off, I want to ask if everyone in the room could please silence your cell phones. Make sure everyone is quiet too. Okay. Thank you very much. That will help us to have an uninterrupted night. Um, we'll see if we can get the microphone available. I just want to make sure that everyone in the room is heard. So uh, I'll just ask you, we have a few speakers that are going to share some information. We'll ask that you hold questions until the end. And we'll allow some time for question and answers uh, near the end of the meeting. And then if we can't get through everybody's questions, we have some maps posted around the room and we'll have members of the We want to take the time and the care to get you the answers that you need. So um, just a couple of other things. If someone is speaking, please uh, don't interrupt them, and we'll, we'll let them get through it. And then ask to be, make sure that you're acknowledged before you ask your question. So we'll just take turns. We'll respectfully listen to each other, and then we'll move through it, and hopefully everyone can be heard tonight. So with, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our incident commander, our deputy incident commander, Shane Deal. Good evening, Shane Deal, Deputy IC with Team 6. I just want to give you a background on myself. Uh, currently, I'm the interagency fire management officer for the Burns Interagency Fire Zone. I uh, grew up in Lakeview, out on the west side. Um, spent a lot of time here in Paisley at uh, basketball, uh, flag football, spring, spring meets, and things like that. So it's good to be back in Lake County. Um, got a lot of family here still, a lot of, a lot of investments in, in Lake County, so I just want to throw that out there for you guys so you know we got a hometown person on this fire. Um, it's not always this important to me, but important to the whole team that we uh, keep the fire tax to a minimum, <coughs> build relationships with the community and the stakeholders, um, help the citizens of Lake County with the fire. Uh, we like to keep the economic impacts to a minimum, um, the timber, the grazing, uh, ensure properties protected, homes, timber, cattle, uh, and other values at risk. And first and foremost, uh, our, our number one priority is the protection of our firefighters and, and the public. Um, right now, with this fire, um, you know, we're work, the, there's a job declaration, I'm sure is all you can know for most of the counties in southern Oregon and eastern Oregon. Um, and it shows true with this with this fire. Um, we got record level record low fuel conditions, record, record level lows, and the fire we're working on is within a 300,000 300, acre buck fill that happened uh, 10 years ago. So we've got uh, tons and tons of down and dead trees, um, lots of snags in there, so the firefighters are having trouble uh, getting working right off the fire's edge. The fire seems to be outflanking us as we go, as an initial, at least an initial attack day. Uh, they build a fire line and the fire push over the line before they can get anything secured. So we're going as tight as possible. We're going as direct as possible on this fire. We are off the edge a little bit, but that's intense for firefighter safety for us to keep ahead of this fire. Um, and without further ado on that, I will turn it over to the our next speaker is uh, Barry Inglert, our supervisor for the Fremont Mining National Forest. Oh, 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 sorry, Barry. One thing I forgot to you. Did that information too close? Um, we're at the region is the planning level five, meaning we have numerous large incidents within the region. Um, I believe we have nine incident management teams out total. And then beyond our region, other regions have very active fire teams as well. So the national we're planning all the five. So all resources are are being prioritized on which fires to go to. Resources are definitely scarce. Um, we're sitting pretty good. We have about 350 folks on our fire, so we're quite a bit more fortunate than others. But we have other resources on order, and uh, we're going to get this the priority bumped up on this fire to get more resources. So, okay, sorry. Mary. So, Barry Yellen, the Forest Supervisor of the Fremont National Forest. 
host for these folks and host for the fire. I'm not going to go uh, in a whole lot of detail, say a whole lot of things. I think it really works in here from folks that are on the ground, um, being required. Uh, your needs, our interests. Um, as Shane said, one of the things I asked them to do, uh, I'm really concerned about the economic impact. One of my primary concerns above, you know, above, right behind firefighter safety, public safety. I really want to keep this have them keep this much more people on four service lands, minimize the impact to private property and businesses in the street, whatever else we have going on around here. And I'm really happy to have these folks here. They were here last year with Love Fire, they were doing a job for us. Uh, they were really good at interacting with the communities, they were really good at interacting with our partners, and the other agencies that we have here. I will be I will be hanging around after the meeting if anybody wants to talk about various issues, uh, whether it's related to the fire or not. I'll, still, I'll talk to you about some other things this evening, but I'm going to come talk to you when you get finished. Thank you. And uh, next we'll hear from uh, Doug McKay for the
estate setting for some of the other folks. Uh, some of the things that we have going on up in the area, the fire, somehow we got to where we are today. So uh, real quick, since we have it in front of us here, we also have this in a couple of places around the room. Uh, this is our, our best estimate of the fire perimeter. This is from the heat detection flight late last night, early this morning. Uh, fire started off kind of over in this area. First day and a half or so, we had winds pushing out of the southwest. You guys both got it locked over the rim on that second night. So, since then, the winds have taken a turn, mostly pushed out of the north and out of the northwest. And that's thrown the fire down this way and the way it has over the past few days. Uh, which is really good news for us up here. So, Saw them on the rim 
next to the point ranch for the Fletcher fire in 07 uh, on that west side of Goose Lake. Uh, picture from that fire, that fire had the north wind strong enough it was ripping trees in half. And we saw it on the toolbox complex on the winter fire just north of right where this Watson Creek fire is now. So, uh, like I said, a tremendous respect for what fire can do in this area. Uh, you folks live in a place that has some rough ground for firefighting. Uh, that said, we've got some really talented and great folks here. So uh, we're going to take advantage of all the opportunities we can. And uh, I'll be around here if there are any questions, but I'll turn it on over to our next speaker. Thank you, Rick. So now we'll hear a couple of comments from Sam Takini, who was the incident commander for the Type 3 team when this fire first started on Thursday and into Friday. All right, hello, everyone. Um, as you said, my name is Sam Takini. I'm the Assistant Fire Management Officer here on the Pace Ranger District. Uh, for the Fremont Mining and National Forest. <clears throat> and I'll just apologize up front if uh, I start using some of the fire legal terminology or acronyms and I try to control myself, but I'll try to do my best with that. Um, Wednesday afternoon when the report came in um, and our dispatch center started dispatching resources, there was actually another local um, IC, IC commander um, at the light who showed up that afternoon and had the fire initially with the initial resources that showed up. And so I wasn't actually there. Um, but as you know that, you know, they were able to try to go direct with, on that fire with some dozers, some aviation, and some, you know, engines, and um, like our initial attack to the person hand through module, I believe. And they, they tried to stay direct on that fire up until dark. Um, the decision was made due to how active it was burning uh, with all the dead trees and snags that were still staying on, that were on fire, uh, they had no way to mitigate for that safety, for that hazard, so they had to pull out that evening and just kind of keep a few resources in the area bedded down um, until the next morning. And that's when uh, a few additional resources like myself were ordered up. So Thursday morning, about 8 a.m. is when I arrived, and we had another local type, uh, another other local type four, we call you know, the number ICs, the lower level initial attack IC, which is usually off of our engines and hand crews. He was there that morning when, the, when a daylight came up, and they, pretty much at daybreak, started going in there again with the dozers they had, the engines they had, and they tried going right back in on the back side of the fire and trying to work dozers around the sides of it um, over there where it started. Um, 8, 8.30 I came in and we transitioned the fire over myself as the incident commander. Uh, by then we had two additional dozers in route. Um, we had helicopters on order and we had a handful more engines showing up as I did. Um, I will say when that fire started, when we got in there, we did have to start putting some safety zones in um, for us to even be working in there safely. We were only one road into that area. and. By that time in the morning, it was burning hot enough that it was burning out those dead trees, and those pockets were burning really hot. Um, and so we felt even kind of uneasy being in there in case the wind shifted and turned and brought that fire back on us. It was going to take a while for those resources to get out of there. And so we had to do a little bit of more work in there just to mitigate for ourselves to be, be in there. Um, so as the morning went on, um, we continued to try to use the dozers and stay direct. Uh, the air cleared up enough for us to get three of our helicopters in there with buckets to try to support that work. And it just seemed like every hour the, the, the dozers kept getting pushed farther away from the fire line. And, but they were still trying to get around both right and left flanks of it. Um, but, and the column was laying over and up over the head of the fire. We couldn't really see in there that well and get very good assessments. We did have a, what we call air attack by then flying around it, and that's just our aerial supervision. So when we have all those extra aviation resources in the air, um, they have their own supervision up in the plane helping coordinate with us, eyes in the sky kind of work with the water and the retard. So by mid-morning, the, the, the main part of that fire, the head of the fire that we talked about, you know, it was moving towards the 28 road. Um, the column picked up enough, and they were able to get uh, retardant planes in there. Um, and they were working on both sides of 28. Uh, but to, to no avail. Um, you know, the fire was burning hot enough and fast enough that it was going through our, our aerial resources that were dropping water and retarding. Um, with, with the wind, even though it wasn't much wind, it picked up enough speed. Um, and by then, the buildings were ineffective on the flanks at that time. 
we made a decision with it being moving so fast towards the rim that evening that we had to get most of our resources out and over to Governor Harvey to, to plan for if it came off the rim that night. So aviation started working with the fire on the rim. Uh, engines and personnel got down on the 29 road on Governor Harvey Road later that night. Um, I hope, so the rest of the fire was pretty much on staff. We didn't have the resources. And um, I mean, I can't say that, that Thursday night, even though the fire was way up on the rim, we did pick up two spot fires over the 29 road. That's how far out it was spotting. And so at least two of the engines, one of the hand crews, the three of the engines, one of the hand crews had to spend like two hours in the middle of the night catching those spot fires uh, on the wrong side of the 29 road. So we kept resources there all night. Uh, we got up again Friday morning, um, know that there was going to be a transition with the Type 2 team, and we kept most of our focus with our resources trying to get in off the 29 road uh, above the 3360. To, to try to go direct in there with our resources, to try to just keep it from getting farther down. Um, the, some additional resources that we got in um, through the Type 3 organization and the Type 2, as they were coming in, we did, we were able to get a few resources back on the south end to start working on some road systems down there. And uh, the ODF brought in a bunch of extra resources. Uh, the Green Diamond folks brought resources in and that really helped get people out on 3315 to start that work. Knowing that the knowing on Friday, what Rick already talked about was turning on us all day. Slowly turning and just, you know, there's so much heat in there. It's not moving really fast, but there's so much heat that's taking out big chunks at a time. So that did help start that work over off of 3315, um, getting the green diamond there, the folks in. And by Friday evening, the 1800 was a transition with the Type 2 team. Um, and, and, like, and once again on Friday, we did run, um, I think, five helicopters, you know, on it, trying to either help the resources on, on the flanks or, or keep it up on the rim, you know, when, when the air would allow us. Um, if I miss anything for those first couple of days, feel free to ask at the end of the speeches. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you very much, Dan. Appreciate it. And now I'll invite up Brian Sullivan, the Tech 2 Teams Operations Section Chief, to talk about our current Brian Sullivan, I'm one of the point off chiefs uh, for the team. So I'll talk a little bit about where we're at as of uh, right now. Um, kind of why we're where we're at. Um, so the first thing is, is you know, that Tech 3 team left us a great um, a great package, you know. The role of Intel and knowledge in the area was, was, was phenomenal for us. We could come in right in, uh, you know, we embraced <coughs> with uh, with the agency at 10 o'clock on Friday, and we had that fire by, by 6 o'clock. So it was a great, great, uh, great transition there. Um, so where we're at, so currently we kind of our, our priorities right now on this fire are the north part of the fire up in here along the uh, government property road. Um, on the east side of the fire, which is the uh, 3315 or the high road, uh, Biggest, biggest reason why the north side, we got the community of Paisley, we got the um, folks down there along the highway, and then we have um, a large section of Green Diamond Timber um, out in this section over here. So, private timber land. Um, today, today um, in the Division Mike, which is this north section along the Jericho Highway Road, um, that fire is held to the uh, south of that road system, so that's our primary convenient line right now. So we turned that fire is held in there. Um, it was really touch and go all day uh, on that north piece. Uh, we had a lot of pushes. Uh, our pushed us a little bit in there. Uh, but again, we were able to hold that in there with crews, engines, helicopters, uh, all everything we had. We focused in on that pretty hard. Um, <clears throat> last night, I got shift change about seven o'clock last night. Over here on the east side of the fire, um, right there where the uh, kind of where on the divide between the green diamond timber and the FS ground, we have some spots that happen in there, uh, right about Fair Tree. Uh, spotted in the green diamond, uh, started to really assess that. It got dark, kind of had to pull back a little bit, but keep an eye on it. This morning we got in there, 
with the heavy equipment, with the green diamond resources, and, and now the wire on that. So that was a huge success this morning. Today, kind of held in check during the morning hours, and then this evening, um, the wind started really pushing hard across the 3315 road. Um, we had to pull back. Um, in kind of there's a road system right in the middle of that green diamond timber. We had to pull back into there because we just couldn't see and we didn't know what we had. It was so smoky in there that the resources didn't feel great, so we just we pulled back. Um, so we'll be assessing that real hard this evening and uh, in the morning. So that's kind of kind of where we're at um, with our division lights or our north or east side of the fire. South side of the fire, um, fire backing. Um, it's, it's not moving real fast. Um, we do have a little bit of activity um, around the uh, Fault Mountain um, lookout area. Um, so we're, we're ensuring that we're, we're protecting that lookout and keeping the fire at, at bay in there. Um, then over here on the west side of the fire, um, which is probably Division Alpha, um, fire is being checked, stay within our private containment lines. Our lines out here are a little bit farther out. Um, then some of these options here. The uh, reason being is, is um, on this side of the fire, the north side of the fire, and the south side of the fire, uh, there's a lot of those good fuel breaks that the, the district has put in. Uh, on this side of the fuel breaks are a little further out. Uh, and that's just allowing us more time to let people cut and get ready for, for when the fire does move that way or if we decide that we can find here to close this off. So um, that's kind of where we're at today. Um, yeah, one thing I will say is, like I said, this morning everything was going great. Um, you know, I had the cooperating meeting, everything was going right where we wanted to. Um, Mary mentioned at the cooperating meeting that um, you know every every afternoon, um, you know this thing is definitely even though it's needed to check on three sides of the fire right now. Every day is just a little touch and go. Um, so it's, it's definitely, I was called a firefighter today. Uh, it's definitely not, uh, it's not laying down for us, let's put it that way. So uh, we're, we're doing everything we can with, uh, with all the resources we have to put that thing, to keep that thing right where we got it. So. Thank you very much, Ryan. So now I'd like to invite up Matt Haley. He is our incident meteorologist. He can tell you a little bit about some of the weather conditions we're experiencing on this fire. Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is Matt Bailey. I'm an incident meteorologist with the National Weather Service. Obviously, there's firefighters here, but you might not have known that we actually have a meteorologist. <laughs> as, uh, as you've heard several of the speakers already talk about, safety is one of the top priorities of this team. Weather plays a major role in firefighters and the general public being safe around incidents. So that's why Specialized meteorologists like myself are deployed to wildfires and other incidents around the country. I'm going to talk a little bit about meteorologists, the Institute Meteorologist Program here. So what we do, I mentioned safety as one of the first things that we're here for. And we also provide weather information and forecast to the team so they can come up with strategies and opportunities to fight the fire. A few of the tools of the trade that we use, remote automated weather stations. So a lot of airports have weather stations, but not a lot of fires occur at airports, fortunately. They're in the forest. We don't have observations. So the way that we get it is through these raw systems that we can set up. There's a few actually permanent raw stations around the area that provide real-time information. But we plan on ordering some of those so we can get some more information of weather conditions on the fire front. Uh, most of my information comes from the computer, so I rely heavily on cell phone satellite data to view my weather radar, my uh, weather satellites, weather models, and information from the RAWS network. Um, it's also good to get out in the field, take weather observation. Yes? What does RAWS stand for? Remote Automated Weather Station. Thank you. Yep. Uh, so field observation also, firefighters have their own equipment where they can take observations and relay that back to us. For instance, this afternoon, we had a firefighter give us information. Uh, it was a weather report that he took in the field, sent it back to us. I put together a forecast, sent it back out to them. It's called a spot forecast. So that gave them kind of a real snippet of the next few hours of what to expect. So that's another way that we can get information is people actually taking observations on the fire line itself. 
Uh, weather briefings, kind of like I'm doing tonight, but more importantly, in the morning, I brief the crews to let them know what the expected weather is for that next operational period. An aerial recon, one way that we can see what the weather is doing is to get a view from the sky and see how it's interacting with the column. So on to the Casey fire itself. So this is probably one of the biggest things that the National Weather Service has had when it comes to improvements to firefights over the last uh, two years. Last year we launched a satellite. It's a GO-16. And it's important because the easiest way to describe it is we basically went from a black and white tube television to a flat panel HDF TV. That's how cool our new satellite is. It's really, really important when it comes to firefight too. The resolution is very, very high. We can pick up an 80 acre fire now, whereas previously we were not able to do that. So the resolution is very, very high. It updates a lot more frequently. So when we see these columns that we saw today develop when the atmosphere gets unstable, we put that big smoke column. We're able to see that develop quickly on the satellite. We can brief crews that it's going plume dominated. Plume dominated fires can create gusty downdrafts, can create its own weather, um, gusty winds, lightning, and occasionally rain, which I've all seen on very large fires. Uh, but having our newer satellite is, is one of the great tools that we have. This is our fire right here, and that's the smoke column from uh, earlier today. We had a federal transport wind from the southwest, so I was trying to push the smoke column off to the northeast. Another thing that we have um, here are pure models. Just like on TV, we have our own versions that we're allowed to look at as well. Doesn't seem to be playing. Uh, but that is the fire burner, and it would, if it played correctly, it would show an animation of basically scattered showers and thunderstorms developing across the region in the next few days. So that's kind of a preview of the actual forecast here. So this is a preview of the forecast that I'm going to be briefing the crews tomorrow. The most concern that I have over the next few days is the chance for scattered showers and thunderstorms. You already heard one person mention drought. You also heard people mention about the, the dead and down trees, large trees that have suffered due to the beetles. So it's nice that we're going to get potentially some rain, but the downside is that we can get lightning. When it comes to a fire weather standpoint, we are concerned when we have dry lightning. Well, this moisture plume that's going to bring the chance for thunderstorms is going to be pretty wet. Um, but that being said, any lightning is going to be bad. Any fuel that is receptive will start to move fire with potential lightning. So that's, that's one concern. The other concern with thunderstorms and firefight is the gusty outflow winds uh, that can occur with these thunderstorms. <coughs> So that's going to be basically what I'm going to be focusing on the next few days. In addition to the gusty, uh, gusty winds that we occasionally see around the rim that Rick had mentioned already. If you have any more, uh, if you have any weather questions, I'll be available after you have more questions. Thanks. Thank you, Matt. So before we move on to questions and answers, I want to invite our partners in the Oregon Department of Forestry to come and speak with us. Dennis, come up and talk. Good evening, everybody. Dennis Lee, uh, <coughs> Klamath Lake District Forester, Oregon Department of Forestry. Um, <coughs> we're in charge of uh, protecting the, the private lands uh, kind of south of uh, Highway 31 here and the intermittent private lands uh, within, the, within the forest boundary there. Uh, just a lot of good information has been shared already. I'd just like to point out um, you know, we work on a, on a cooperative basis here in the South Central Oregon area. Uh, we're trying to send the closest forces uh, that are out there in the field to the fire. So we're all fighting each other's fires. It doesn't matter if it's green or white or uh, yellow and on the map. Um, you know, we're, we're trying to get, get there. We're working with each other on a cooperative basis. And uh, you got a lot of really good Firefighters and a lot of really good folks uh, locally who've been uh, doing a battle here and, and dealing with this uh, out there daily and really trying their best and, and doing a good job of it. So I know the fire's big and that's uh, that's not a great thing, but they're, uh, the conditions are, are pretty terrible right now. To be honest, with the fuel conditions, 
Uh, you got the weather conditions that um, the meteorologist has pointed out. It's a it's a tough go. Um, the other thing that I wanted to point out to you, uh, while we're working together, there's a, there's a lot of folks in the background. Uh, somebody mentioned that it was a, a PL5, um, basically means there's so many fires going on uh, all over the nation and other places that engines and crews and aircraft and all the stuff that we need in order to get a handle on this thing are, are scattered all over the place and taken up. Um, and so getting those things, getting those resources is a huge challenge. So there's a lot of folks in the background that are doing the best they can to get a hold of uh, resources, uh, spending a lot of time and a lot of nights uh, moving things around, uh, beg, borrowing, and stealing from, from other places or other areas. Um, you know, we got a, from an ODF perspective, we got a lot of aircraft uh, that we're trying to, you know, supplement uh, here with. We've got initial attack resources that we're trying to, uh, engines and crews and stuff that were are here. We're, you know, locally, I know we have, we have uh, a lot of initial attack resources that are really have been ground in and, and are still in the firefight here uh, along with the team. So um, it's a it's a big challenge and a, and a lot of moving parts. And uh, just want to assure you that, that there's a lot of folks out there uh, that are trying to get everything they can in order to, to help uh, the situation and, and get the fire under control. So, thank you. Thank you. So uh, we have about 30 minutes that we can devote to questions and answers. You have a sense of the expertise that we have in the room from some of the presentations that you saw. I'm going to ask you again to uh, please, please just one question at a time. If you raise your hand, I'll point, I'll point to you, acknowledge you, and then we'll get you talking. And uh, please phrase your questions as succinctly as possible. And remember that we're here tonight to talk about the Watson Creek Fire. So while there may be other questions on your mind and there may be some things we're willing to talk with you after the meeting on the side about other issues, the expertise that we do have in this room is best targeted to help deliver information about the Watson Creek Fire. So with that, sir, your hands in the air and I'll take your question first. What started this? That is under investigation. So we'll know more about that when the fire investigation is complete. Good question. Uh, yes, sir. Um, I appreciate all the detail you gave us. But with all your expertise, could you give us a longer guesstimate of what's going to happen? How long will it take to get under control? What's it going to do with the wind? Just a rough idea. Uh, let's see. Yet. Ryan, do you want to answer that question? I can you look at you just the wall and answer this gentleman's question. Wow. Good question. You know what? Let's get Really hard to answer. Um, you know, it really depends on the winds, I would say. So, you know, I would get a blow down into off the wind and down, you know, so that could push the fire that way. So, um, you know, with, if the wind stayed the way they were today, you know, I could see the fire moving further to the east. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm not from here, so I don't know your typical wind pattern, but, you know, Kind of like how I would look at it. So typical wind patterns, that's kind of going to be where that fire will want to go, that's where it's going to go. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a really tough question to answer. So, anyway, what I would say is, is the priority to get our, where the risks, where the uh, value of risk are, that's what we're focusing on all, that's what we're focusing on tonight. Once we hopefully get a handle on that, then we'll focus on the things that aren't quite as at risk. So that, uh, that southern and that um, western flank there. So we're going to focus everything on that north and east and, and try to keep that as tight as it is right as you see it there. And then we'll, we'll, we'll work around the other side. Yeah, you have a question? Talking about what keeps 
keeping you up at night. Um, we'll be glad to chat with you after this. <laughs> Yeah, the gentleman earlier said that there was some good opportunities uh, between where the fire is currently and the dead horse, the, the larger beetle kill. Is that a good opportunity for the fire to take off or a good opportunity to stop the fire? What was the... <laughs> 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 yeah, sorry. Yeah, um, please answer that. What I meant was uh, there are some places where there are opportunities to stop the fire. Oh, okay. okay. Just a minute. Good point of clarification. Yes, sir. Why does the containment at this time? The containment is currently estimated at zero percent. Yes, sir. What's the main direction of the fire heading? The main direction of the fire. Uh, what's the, the main? What's the main direction tonight, Ryan? Um. So today, when the fire came off, was to the east. Uh, east, southeast. Yes, so what's the best opportunity in that direction to engage the fire? So, like I said, we're, we're really on the east side. We're really focused around like 33, 15. Had some, had some challenging conditions out there today. Like I said, got a little smoked out. Fire didn't push towards that. Uh, we'll know a lot more this evening. Nothing lays down. The fire lays down. We'll know a lot more then. And we'll get in there and assess that if we can. You know, if there's some spots out there, pick them off potentially, you know, we'll just be assessing that. Uh, and then to the north, uh, like I said, the fire is still south of the, uh, of the uh, 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 49th. So the fire is still south of that, that's where we want to. That's our goal. Yes, ma'am. So if the fire continues to go north, north, east, uh, towards this town of Paisley, approximately how far are you going to let the fire get before you start to with you in the town and you still live up a bell or uh, we're right in the line? So we, we determined today if it crosses 29 Road, we'll notify the local fire administration to start the evacuations, level three evacuations, I believe, at that, at that stage. And, and work with the county to get more resources and things and things that. So how far are we now in places, the fire has is at the point. Is that the point? Yes, yes. So We're going to take it to the south. Yeah. 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 Yes, sir. From your map there, you've got about two miles to handle you, and then about another two miles past that until it hits the old fire that happened two years ago. Is there a good chance of stopping the fire once it hits the path? Um, Rick addressed that a little bit in his presentation. Um, is that what right? Sure. Barry Schulberger, Interior City uh, Fire Staff Officer. Uh, we just drove that area today and uh, took a look at that old fire line on Withers Fire. Uh, a lot of grass. Fuel type 
than they are on that field type that you see that has all the dang lodgepole stacked up. So it's a, it's a plus and it's a minus. Um, if you're there when it's kind of, and it's hitting that grass and that old scar on the withers fire at a time when the wind isn't just pushing it really hard, it's a great opportunity for us to make a really good solid line. If it's doing it when it's one of those really gusty times, we're going to have to get way out in front of it, almost on the other side of the withers fire, and probably because of the speed it can flow and, and grow, and start some activity there to try to keep it where it was on the downside. That's the, that's the truth. Out will be accurate. Thank you. So, 
it, and we don't put anything out unless we know that it is accurate. And uh, I believe the last time was last night, about 6 o'clock, we put out special information. And uh, throughout the day, I put out information about this meeting. But I don't know if Clark's going to be the, the person to contact me for any uh, updates or anything like that. Clark is working with our in fire information efforts. So I'm glad that you have a relationship with Clark. And I know he's been close and he's been contacting you. So he is working with the fire information shop. And we are communicating closely with him. Um, Anything on Linsa Web that we push out with the official update and then the stuff, the stuff, the stuff on Twitter and Facebook channels and the Fremont Wyneema Twitter and Facebook channels. We're all uh, sharing the same, our common operating picture of what's happening with the fire, we're communicating, and we're sharing that information as, as in real time as we can. My, one channel might be a little faster than others, but we are trying to share that. Some of the other postings uh, that are happening in the community, if they if they don't reflect the official channel, there might be some speculations or some sort of guesswork going on there. And so I really appreciate you taking the time and the care to check in with the official channels of InsaWeb, Skafunk, and the Fremont Landing and National Forest. Yeah, if they get worse, then uh, we will always put out any information that we put out to us. Thank you, Doug. That's how people in the community know they can trust your information. Yes, sir? We estimated on uh, how many acres have burned so far? The latest uh, infrared flight last night was just over 16,000 acres. Did we get, I'm looking around, I don't know, Ryan, was, was there an estimate this afternoon of anything? Usually the best, most accurate reading is that nighttime seeking camera flight. And so that's really, we really anchor in on that and that happens late at night. And so in the morning we have that and that's the best information. Um, other acreage uh, predictions or guesses, you know, there are best right. guesses based on the area. So hang tight for that infrared number and you'll, you'll have the best. Yes, sir. Just a general question. Um, in the bug kill, other than the fact that you have a lot of down timber that you have to deal with, does the fire burn a lot hotter and move a lot faster? Yeah. Uh, yeah, there's a lot more tanks. Okay. Um, so it's, it, it doesn't allow us to get tight. Kind of like what Sam was mentioning on that initial attack. It, it started to tighten and it has to move it away a little bit. It's just getting hotter and hotter as a day.